Good afternoon, everybody. Well, history lessons basically say that some of you will fall asleep. Um, so my way of measuring if that is a good presentation or not is just to look at you and count the number of sleeping people in the beginning and at the end of my presentation. Um, I am 37 years old, so I am almost you know, a fourth um, um, of the age of the total of Pogenpol. However, I'm also German, and that is not really um, the right time to be standing in front of you, since the focus country this year is not Germany, but Denmark. I understand Germany was on last year, and normally Germans are stereotyped to be punctual. I'm one year late, so I apologize for that. But it's this year our 120th anniversary, and it's also this year my opportunity to talk for 25 minutes about kitchens, something that I enjoy a lot, and hopefully you will enjoy too. As already mentioned previously, our kitchen company is the eldest company in the world with 120 years. Um, Pogenpol has not only been an old company, but we've also been observing kitchen development over 120 years. So my first question to you is, who of you owns a kitchen? Raise your hands. So we have quite a lot of people who don't own a kitchen. I'm interested to see how you survive every evening. <laughs> Kitchen is something that is um, affecting all of us, but also designers, because um, um, it really the big milestones in those 120 years were um, based on the vision to always improve the kitchens. The question always is, how do you measure that? Our founder said he wanted to improve the kitchen. Now, after 120 years, I'd like to provide to you today a framework how we can measure it. But not only that, I would like to also unveil the exhibition um, of 120 years of kitchen history. Basically, what you can see there are artifacts that have never left our factory for more than 80, 90 years. Actually, they've never only left the factory. They've also never been on a plane. They've never been unpacked and repacked. So um, later on during this presentation, I'm going to take you through a quick run through it. This exhibition is more than just talking about kitchen. It's really also a talk about history. It has some interesting milestones in the history that some of you may not be aware of. It talks also about songs. For every single year of those 120 years, we've picked a nice song. So when you walk down the path of kitchens, um, and I really invite you to do that afterwards too, um, always look down on the floor and look at that little piece of music, and maybe that, you know, a little memory jumps up what happened this year. Next to it, there will be lots of kitchen artifacts, which I will take you through now. So back to my part, how do you measure kitchen development, how do you measure if it's a real revolution or just a step-by-step -step change? It's too easy to come to you guys and say it's all about form and function. Um, when it comes to kitchens, the way we look at it is really looking at three different criteria. The first one being hygiene. A kitchen needs to provide an environment where you can process, store your food, and, and also you know, clean it up afterwards in a clean and tidy way. You certainly don't want to have your food exposed to bacteria. Secondly, the way we look at kitchens is they need to be functional. Yes, of course, you want to have kitchens where you can you know, have fun, invite your friends, have a nice dinner, but it's also a place of work. You have to get the work done and hopefully get it done quite efficiently. And last but not least, it's also supposed to support a certain lifestyle. And I will be taking you through those three elements to show you what I mean with this and how things have changed in the last 120 years. My personal objective for this presentation is A, to avoid that some of you are falling asleep, and B, that hopefully this framework will serve you and the history steps that you can think of the next step of kitchen development yourself. Let's start with hygiene. Hygiene seems to be a basic need. It was not always fulfilled. In the old days, a kitchen was usually um, using a lot of framed doors, lots of edges. It had a lot of open shelves. So when you stored away your kitchen utensils, they were exposed to oxygen. If they weren't cleaned right, food started to rot. You had lots of edges where food remains could get stuck. So it was difficult to clean your kitchen. In 1923, one big step was to stop all those highly decorative kitchens with lots of framed doors and lots of edges and make them simple, and also put together a storage space, which is really logical, so you can store away your kitchen appliances, your kitchen um, tools, and you know, avoid too much contact with um, um, bacteria. This kitchen is in various shapes and forms back there too. I will not um, talk about it later on, 
but that style was quite prominent and is still in many ways used today. Another step which for us um, um, in my company was much more important was the invention of a good lacquer. Before, kitchens always were using timber, solid wood kitchens or you know, whatever type of wood is firstly dark. So many of those kitchens were put into the back of your house. Why? Because, well, it's dark, it's not really a representative, presentable piece of furniture, but it's also difficult to clean. With the white lacquering process, which is a 10-layer um, lacquer process, suddenly the kitchens were simple to clean. Suddenly they were um, you know, also scratch resistant. And suddenly you could use the color of white. And a white piece of furniture suddenly became a presentable piece of furniture. And slowly but steadily, those kitchen furniture started to move from the back of your house to the front of your house. Now, since this is the brand and design forum, I'd like to also talk a little bit about brand and show you how advertising was done around about 70 to 80 years ago. Maybe a very Germanic way of advertising, <laughs> very straight to the point, not very much fun. You can see that this strong lacquer was sold as an iron glove. Strong and scratch resistant like an iron glove. I think that's typical German to market it like that. But still as soft touch as a little butterfly. So it still felt like wood. Or the advertisement below, um, at that time also, you know, it was obvious that it was only women who were doing housework. At that time it was then the housewife seeing that, you know, ah, oh, with this lacquering process, it's easy to clean my furniture even if it gets dirty, right? This was for us and for the kitchen industry a big breakthrough. But this is not where hygiene stopped. From then on, hygiene didn't, wasn't such a big issue anymore. It actually turned around. It was no longer the challenge to avoid food remains getting stuck in the kitchen cabinets. It was suddenly the objective, which is today the objective, to avoid that the kitchen cabinets and the appliances emit hazardous substances. So it started to turn the other way around. So since 15 years, um, we, for instance, cover all our edges with a certain way to um, avoid emittance of formaldehyde urea, which um, for the ones who, um, of you work in the United States and other countries, um, it's very relevant to a uh, LEED certification, um, you know, to have healthy substances in your kitchen. Today, kitchens across all companies become more and more specific and more modern when it comes to the utilization of materials. For instance, glass finishes. These type of kitchens actually are ready for chemical laboratories, right? We have come to a point now where they're no longer just clean, they become truly laboratories. So the journey for us in the hygiene part was really back in the days, you know, you put it into the back of your house because, you know, it was dirty, it was not tidy, to today's situation where you can choose from many, many materials and even you can ask the question, does the kitchen cabinet and the appliances themselves emit hazardous substances? Let's talk about the next level, functionality. Functionality is what most people will think of a kitchen. It needs to get the job done. In 1921, a social democrat called Helene Witte looked at kitchens and housework in a very or, um, yeah, initial way. She actually tried to you know, analyze how you can improve housework by, for instance, reducing the mileage on foot from one room to another when you do your housework, or within a room from one part of your kitchen to another, whether it's from the sink to your um, um, fridge, whether it's from your fridge to the hob, um, whether it's from one storage area to another. She was already starting to paint different and look at different ways how to plan your kitchen. The real breakthrough was done by a lady called Mrs. Schütte. Lihotsky. Mrs. Schüttel Lihotsky developed the so-called Frankfurt kitchen, Frankfurter Küche. This kitchen has been the biggest breakthrough in kitchen design in the last 120 years. Almost every kitchen you see today follows this principle. What she has done, she has looked at the social environment. It was just in Germany at that time, um, uh, past wartime, the First World War was over. Space was getting precious. Many people had to deal with this family situation in smaller space. So she had to look at two things. A, how can I get my kitchen usage more efficient, plan the kitchen in a way so I don't have to walk a lot from one to another place. B, 
but also secondly, how can I use my space, which is getting less in a more efficient way? And she has invented the fitted unit kitchen with interconnected cabinets and no longer freestanding alone cabinets as it was before. This type of logic has inspired us and many others in the industry and has not really changed until today. We, for instance, um, 22 years um, later, um, started to mass produce this logic even. Before then, and you will see some of those examples there, we had individual solutions, um, but um, starting from 1950, and that's more than 60 years ago, from that day on, those fitted kitchens started to be in mass production around the world. And it's really interesting to see how little has changed until today. Because the reality is that since that day, the major breakthroughs in designs for functionality reasons have really been small. One example is, for instance, how to use those cabinets, those interiors in a smarter way. Just pullouts, three years after the industrial solution was um, um, offered with the Form 1000, it was just about new ways of pullouts. One, for instance, a pullout for food, for bottles where you had little holes in the, in the, in, on the bottom of it so the bottles wouldn't fall if you pull it out, and for scoops, one for pots, and one for the corner unit, always that issue that you can't use the space efficiently in the corner of your room. You would see all those three elements that are, again, almost 60 years old today in one shape or another. But it was always following the logic of functionality. So now you wonder what am I going to present in the next slides. And for that, I would like to take you with my microphone to a little journey. Thank you. OK, so the next kitchen, here I am. <laughs> the next kitchen is really something where we tried something new, the Kolani bubble kitchen. So please follow me to our kitchen from 1970, a kitchen that has been created with a designer called Luigi Kolani, a kitchen that was designed for the year 2000. I think it's 2012 by now, and I don't think many of you have this type of kitchen. It was an experiment, and he thought that would be not only the most functional kitchen, but also the kitchen that can be used in space. Because in his view, most of us would be eating and pr pr uh, processing food in space by now. Let me explain to you why this is the most functional, efficient kitchen. And while I, I could step inside, but you couldn't see me then, what you see in there is basically just a chair that you can turn around and all your kitchen cabinets can be used without even standing up. So this is the great thing. This is the absolutely most functionally efficient footage mileage kitchen in the world. It has only been produced once, so if anyone is interested to buy it, it would be my first sale of it. But it's definitely um, a very nice experiment, and I'm um, you know, only welcoming you to try it out later yourself. We've had other ideas of how to develop kitchens. One was a little bit more ergonomic, not only functional, but ergonomic. The problem you usually have in your homes is that in your kitchens, you do not only have two partners, a wife and a husband, who are the same height. In many cases, you have a husband who's probably taller than the wife. And since now the world changed and suddenly the husband was doing some kitchen work too, you had the problem that either the wife or the husband didn't stand in an ergonomically healthy position, in a posture that was easy to work with. So for instance, 20 years ago, already a movable, height-adjustable worktop was developed. So when the wife was doing her work, she could pull down the worktop, and when the husband was doing it up, he could pull it up. You hardly see it today. It's quite interesting that you don't. I think actually it's, a, it's been a quite nice development, and I wonder why it's not used so much. Now, let's talk about something more fun. The last piece of our functional journey. A kitchen that is not only just functional, but fun. It's a kitchen for men, so please join me. It's our Porsche design kitchen. So since I can't see myself, I hope you can see me. This kitchen, hold on. There we are. This kitchen. <laughs> This kitchen is a kitchen for men. It's like a sports car. It's using not only materials like a sports car with aluminum, with um, carbon. Uh, it's also 
designed to work with men. And that is also that it's um, you know, uh, not only looking a little bit like a Porsche Carrera if you take two steps away from it, but it's also a kitchen that has some little functional goodies in, like for instance, opening and closing the cabinet of the walls, cabinets, by hand. Let me show you that. So I think B&O would be very proud of me now with the sound of my clapping hand the door opens and closes. The reality is though it closes just by itself. I just wanted to make a little bit of a point of sound matters. You also have here a bowl, which is also working very nice. Normally when you close, ah, you can't see me. When you close the, the bowl, usually you just have a little top on the side to open and close it. What we have done, we've created something which is real joyous for men. You press a nice little blue illuminated button and electronically, the sink will close and open up, right? It's absolutely mandatory for your day-to-day -day use, but it's, of course, great fun. And down this exhibition, more and more kitchens are sitting here and are just waiting for you to be explored. I'm not going to take you through all of them, but as I can tell you, this is not only about kitchens, so, you know, why not spend a second back there? Good, that was functionality. So also quite a long way from kitchens that stand alone and didn't really help you to be efficient in your home to a kitchen, whether it's the fitted kitchen by Mrs. schuttel Hotsky, or whether it's the bubble kitchen without walking at all, or whether it's just kitchens, you know, which are for ergonomic reasons, and last but not least, kitchens that are just for fun. Let's talk about the third element. I don't know if I still have to keep that. Does this work? No, I will work like that. Now it's about lifestyle. So it's not enough to have just kitchens that work for functional reasons and clean reasons. Kitchens need to also consider the social cultural environment and the specific needs of your client, especially if you are working in the luxury segment like we do. So lifestyle has changed tremendously over the last 120 years and it will continue to change. 120 years ago and even more in the 19th century, the upper class who could afford it tried to stay out of the kitchen. Kitchen, as you remember from a hygiene part, is dirty. It's a place of work. So I'll let my maid do the work in the dirty kitchen. And I will spend my time with my guests and my family in the pre presentable, nice dining room. Far away, ideally, from the kitchen. So um, back in those days, it was absolutely uncool to be in a kitchen. That has changed quite a bit. Around about 60 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, sorry, 50 years ago, we started to see more and more that not only the rich people, um, but across all classes started to enjoy cooking. And suddenly it was normal that kitchens had an integrated dining desk. That trend continued, and the biggest step for us was the invention of the kitchen island. For you, it may seem like the natural thing, but for us this was a major milestone in kitchen history. Why was it like this? Because most of your time you spend in a kitchen is not cooking it, it's preparing it, cutting the vegetables in the beginning. And in the old days with the standard cabinets, what you were doing when you were preparing the food, you were watching the wall. You were standing in front of your, and many of us still do today, who don't have such a kitchen island, you prepare your food and you watch the wall. Not very um, yeah, accommodating, not very social, and not much fun. So the kitchen island was turning around the principles. Suddenly, while you were preparing the food, you could watch um, you know, into the open space, you could talk to your friends, and you suddenly started to more and more open up the kitchen. No longer a separate room, but suddenly an open space into the living room area and the dining room area. Kitchen island was a big breakthrough. Since then, we started to open up kitchens more and more. So one big trend that you all are aware of with kitchens is kitchens alone don't exist. It's much more about living space as a whole. Dining, living room, kitchens as one. And um, another trend was, for instance, why you know, not pull technology into your, into your kitchens with computers, smart grids, online grocery shopping, television sets, music, and so forth. Why not even turn the whole principle around like in the 19th century, where your dining room and a kitchen room separate, why not actually move your kitchen into the dining room? 
So people will still want to have a separate dining room if they have space. But why not actually have a kitchen where you can prepare your food, or you have a maid preparing it, or a chef preparing it. You put it on a little wagon, which you can see there. Oops, maybe not. Which you can see there. It's keeping the food warm, and then you just conveniently roll down that wagon and integrate it into your dining desk in those areas, whether it's then to keep it cool or whether it's to keep it warm. You actually move your whole kitchens into your dining room. And last but not least, our latest um, development is the complete opening up of kitchens. Um, this kitchen here is not, uh, no longer just talking about cabinets on a wall. It's no longer just talking about kitchens. It's talking about designing and planning the floors, the ceiling, talking about dining desks which are integrated, talking about chairs which are integrated, talks about an arc that literally opens up into the open space. So the trend opening up has come a long way now. No longer we are separating kitchens and dining rooms. It's completely different now. So these are the three main trends. And if I would like to invite you to think of any further ideas how the next 120 years will develop, and I'll come back to that later on, my suggestion would be think of those three elements because they've always proven to be relevant in the last 120 years. The trends that we see today, just to give you something, some thoughts and some understandings from our own um, uh, experience, is that when it comes to hygiene, today's trends are really people do not want to work with kitchen companies who cut corners when choosing materials. They want to have a kitchen where they know that the materials you use are from a source that you know, that you can trust. They also want to make sure that they're eco-friendly and that the investment into the brand stays. Because in many cases, when you buy an apartment, let's say for five million Hong Kong dollars, and you put a Pong Pole or whatever other brand kitchen in, after the next 10, 15 years, you want to be sure that A, the kitchen works, but also the brand has still the same value. Because that will be one of the key brands of your apartment. When it comes to functionality, a current trend which is very hot around the world, and maybe it's thanks to all those cooking shows, many customers of ours do not just want a kitchen for everyday work. They want a kitchen that works for them as if they were a professional chef. They, it's a hobby. It's a serious hobby to many people. So we are partnering with professional chefs so that the distances and the you know, way of working in a kitchen is almost you are delivering 10 five-star, three-star Michelin dinners every night, which no one of us does. The other one is that people want the kitchen to work forever. However, most of us design and change their houses before that. But at the time of purchase, that is a very big demand. When it comes to lifestyle, I've already talked about the trend towards open space that will continue radically. Um, and also that no longer you will have one designer who looks into the kitchen and one interior designer who looks into the rest. Designers need to look at it as a whole, and we as kitchen companies need to know that. We need to be partnering with you, and you need to be partnering with us, so that it becomes one integrated design concept. For us, this is not only good news. It's good news because it becomes a bigger concept, but it also means that almost every single kitchen, and really every single pong pole kitchen produced at home in Hereford, is unique. So what are the main ideas, personal ideas, that I have for the future? Firstly, it's going to be echo all the way, all the way. Today, most of the certificates you are facing are very limited. They're only looking at the choice of wood. Did you get it from a you know, um, sustainable forest? It's not only looking in the future at this. It's going to be looking at the whole process of manufacturing, transporting it. It will be looking at your whole home. And it will not be country specific. There will be more and more international standards that we have to fulfill. When it comes to functionality, this motto, big is, or space is luxury, will change or will be added more and more to be small can be luxury too. You will have many people who will have a rather small but very high, nicely located apartment who want to have more than just a functional kitchenette. They want to have something that makes a statement but still works. So that will be a big challenge for all of us. How can you design a kitchen either by taking out some functionalities or by putting them in a smart way into the existing smaller space so that it still becomes a true design and luxury statement. 
And last but not least, flexibility. As I've said before, whilst many of our clients will come to us, almost all of them will say, I want a kitchen from you that has the quality to last for two lifetimes. Most of us, most of them, will change their homes after five years. Maybe because their design taste changed. Maybe it was because the children moved out and suddenly you move the kitchen in a different way than before. So our challenge is to provide a kitchen that maybe you can change yourself at low cost after five years. You can put different front finishes on, so the color may change. You may change the design of the cabinets. All these type of things, I believe, will be big, big challenges for us going forward. Good, that was a lot of me talking, and the time is running. So I would like to use my very last slide as a challenge to you, because how often do I have a chance to talk to so many brainy designers who are still awake, most of you? So let's take up the challenge. Are you guys ready for the next 120 years? And one thing that I really, you know, with my partner Sandra, really, really care about is to move away from being so European driven with the kitchens. Most of our kitchens are based and are supporting continental European Western food, how you process it. Why not think of the perfect Chinese kitchen? Why not think of a kitchen that, for instance, provides hygiene standards for processing oily food, you know, with splashbacks, and more than just that? Why not think of functionality that thinks not only of continental European ways of preparing and cooking food and cleaning it up, but of the way that, you know, is relevant in other countries, like, for instance, in China? And, for instance, rice storage is an example, right? You never find it in a European kitchen. And the last one is lifestyle. Yes, there's different appeals to, um, to design, right, or to taste. And I'm on thin ice now talking about good or bad taste, but with designers, it's like committing suicide. But there's a different taste outside, right? And um, that could also be somewhere, maybe more colors, different patterns, different touch and feel, different materials are more popular in one area compared to another. So help us design the perfect Chinese kitchen. And please stay awake also for the other ones after me. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Please stay there. I have a tip. I think you should, the, the biggest challenge for Chinese cooking is get, how to get rid of the smell. <laughs> so I think that should be rule number one. But uh, we have time, I think, for two questions for Lars before we break for coffee and a chance for you to have a look and touch the wonderful aerodynamic kitchens we have over there. So two questions, please, anyone. Yes, a lady over there, please. Thank Hi. you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm Emily, and I have a question. I'm wondering, as you mentioned about lifestyle, like times are changing now. People are spending more time at work, less time at home, and less time cooking, and the domestic role is changing. And there's also businesses in which people can go in and cook there, and then afterwards they don't have to do the washing up because that's the part that most people don't like to do. So I'm wondering how are these changing affecting your company and how are you adapting to it and what uh -huh. are some strategy or how do you foresee these things um, for your company and reconnecting the relationship between uh, the kitchen and your customers. Thank you. Yeah, good question. The, this is a little bit going into the trend of that small can be luxury too. That could be a design um, challenge to think of which parts of your kitchen do certain people no longer need. Yeah? Because if you spend you know, five out of seven nights eating out, whether it's at work or whether it's in a, in a restaurant or you're bringing home ready-made food or whatever it is, do you then really need a fully fleshed kitchen with all hops, ovens, with all the different um, features, with lots of storage here and there, right? So one thing that I truly believe is that there will be different types of kitchens which do not offer on purpose all functionality, right? Where you could even think about starting your food process from work and you know, getting something into, the, um, into your kitchen. So by the time you get home, it's already halfway ready, right? So these type of ideas, I call it small can be luxury, right? It's really, and you know, is I believe something that we'll have to look into. Thank you. One more question, please. Anyone? Otherwise, I'm going to ask one. Ah, yes, we have a guy there. So, um, thank you for the toilet house um, presentation. Um, oh, thank you, uh, why did you design a Chinese kitchen? Because um, my uh, opinion is uh, with the idea of globalization. 
uh, I think because nowadays, even uh, I feel the German people, they don't only cook German food only. Correct. They cook Asian food, they cook Indian food, as well like the upper class or the middle class people. They don't cook and just only Asian food. They also cook other Western food. So my question is, uh, why not um, desire um, kitchen for, go, uh, for Gobo? I guess that's what we do today. Because today we are selling lots of these kitchens in China and in other um, regions. But um, those kitchen trends I've shown you were all coming from Europe. Right? So I just, um, you know, actually I, I fully agree with you when it comes to Germans or others not actually so interested in German food. You know, there is a big, big trend that wok hops and all these uh, materials, better cooking, cooking hoods so the, you know, the odor is pulled out um, and better is happening in other markets too. But I just believe that the whole 120 years were too Europe-centric, right? And whilst all other countries and cultures have their own kitchens, there has very rarely been a truly academic, fully thought-through approach of how to design such a kitchen in those countries too, and couple them with real good quality, right? And not just with local hand-manufactured carpenters, but really, you know, put a high quality against them too. That is why I... Um, why I believe this could be an opportunity. Thank you. But I'm going to ask you a question last. How much is that Louis Kalani, Luigi Kalani kitchen? It's a very typical Hong Kong, Kong question you're going to get. Well, um, whoever is interested, you can have a coffee with me. <laughs> um, but I'm going to tell you that the insurance alone is quite high. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lars. Thank you. Thank you.